I am Zev Elif. In the last almost two years, I have had the dutiful pleasure of serving as Gratz's president. In that capacity, I usually thank other people. And so it uh, makes good sense for me to first introduce the program by thanking Mindy, Dodie Klimok, Naomi Hausman, especially Lori Cohn for conceiving and furnishing this really interesting and really dynamic program. I also acknowledge a uh, former Gratz librarian, Nancy Nitzberg, who's returned to us and it's really a pleasure to have you here, um, who along with everybody at Gratz College has worked very diligently and dutifully over almost 130 years to perpetuate not just the biography, but the legacy, her commitment to social justice, to Jewish and welfare for, the, for all of humanity. After all, she just found 18 different Jewish organizations, but also founded the Orphan Asylum in Philadelphia, that being of Rebecca Gratz. Uh, I want to take you back in time for just a moment, about 99 years ago, and this is from the pages of the Jewish Exponent from 1924. Uh, Dropsy College, which used to be next door to Gratz College, now it's a part of the University of Pennsylvania, their Katz Center, uh, they acknowledge the remarks of the keynote lecture of their commencement, which was in his time one of the leading Philadelphia Jewish philanthropy, uh, philanthropists, excuse me, Solomon Solis Cohn. Uh, he based his remarks on biblical texts and it was well dignified, writes the Jewish exponent, but they didn't produce a transcript of what he said. Thankfully, Posthumously, in a private collection, his, his children produced his remarks stated 99 years ago, a couple miles down Broad Street. He remarked on what he called the Philadelphia Group. And he said the following did Solis Cohn. These about this Philadelphia Group. These are brilliant names in this dynasty of light and learning. Isaac Leeser, Sabato Moraes, Mayor Salzberger, Cyrus Adler. It has existed for more than a century, extending into the present academic year of Dropsy College to think of Jewish educational activities, local and national, is to call its role of the Philadelphia group. The teaching of children brings to mind Rebecca Gratz and the Hebrew Sunday School movement. The training of teachers recalls Hyman Gratz, and I didn't make this up, it's right here, I promise, you can see it afterwards, Gratz College. The combination in a Jewish atmosphere of secular culture where the study of Hebrew is represented by Solomon Solis, he's referring to his ancestor, and the Hebrew Educational Society. Advanced research in Hebrew and cognate, I still know what cognate means, languages, brings us again to Moses, Aaron, Dropsy, and this college. And with the production and dissemination of English books on Jewish topics, we come back to Isaac Leeser and Solis and Salzberger and the Jewish Publication Society, which is currently housed at Gratz College. In fact, the entire library is now our reference collection. And so Rebecca Gratz is the first name of many who are represented in that very auspicious Philadelphia group when scholars claimed that Philadelphia was the great capital of Jewish culture and living. And that's what we're here to celebrate and learn a little bit more about. Um, I'm thrilled also to introduce Rabbi Daniel Levitt, who as of June 1st is our director of our newly endowed Daniel and Louise Cohn Adult Jewish Learning Program, named after Dan and Louise. Dan Cohn was the longtime board member and trustee of the Gratz Trust. <clears throat> I also want to point out that the, digitiz the, the digitization project uh, it's a bittersweet thing to describe it. Uh, it was conceived by, in a conversation between me and my late dear friend, Diane Ashton. And um, it was meant to not just perpetuate the reputation and the personality of Rebecca Gratz, but to learn from it. Uh, it's been, uh, and I thank, I thank him over and over again, uh, is Richard Drucker, Diane's husband, for helping to support it. And together with a number of partners, and I'll introduce Melissa Clapper in a moment, first and foremost among them was Melissa. Uh, we worked really hard to think about this project. We identified partners, the University of North Carolina, the Rosenbach, who's a partner, uh, and I should indicate other partners, the Weizmann National Museum of American Jewish History, the Female Hebrew Benevolent Society, of course, Mikvah Israel, in which the Gratzes were longtime members and the Jewish exponents, 
acknowledge the people here who represent those important institutions as our partners, we began to digitize and transcribe, it's quite expensive, those envelopes are meant to help cover the expenses, um, but to build something really spectacular. And that in the digital age, how in an institution that for 130 years has never quite remained the same, the through line, the mission, supporting Jewish wisdom and education has re represented a static commitment to Gratz. But Gratz has been quite successful at leveraging its moment. And right now you're about to see how we are leveraging our digital age. And that's a credit to Diane Ashton. She lived to see it being onboarded, but not like all of you are, to see it really come into full bloom. And that's something that I regret, but I know that she would be proud uh, that we're doing this also as a tea party. <clears throat> One of the most remarkable partners in all of this has been Melissa Clapper, a multiple time National Jewish Book Award winner. Melissa was at Rowan University where Diane was, uh, Diane's uh, colleague as a professor there. She is now working to complete Diane's final manuscript. Professor Clapper, take it from me, please, is a world expert, not on the history of Jewish women, but also about Jewish childhood. Um, each one of those books is absolutely incredible. Uh, maybe I have to buy some uh, new ones because mine are rather dog-eared and bookmarked at this point in time. Uh, and just to say how, how lucky we are that uh, Melissa is here with us today, that she is a local scholar, an educator, writer, a role model, um, to say nothing about her recent accolades on the Jeopardy trivia show. It is my deep pleasure to introduce my good friend, my scholar, my absolute peerless friend, Melissa Clapper, to share remarks both on Diane, but mostly on Rebecca Gratz. Before I do that though, I also want to acknowledge Rebecca Gratz. Uh, this is, I want to say a great, 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 great niece from the Ben Gratz. I thought it was always Benjamin Gratz, but in the letters, as we'll maybe see, uh, she called him Ben. Um, and to have you here with us, uh, for somebody like me who likes to hang out in the 19th century, it's good to know that there are uh, pathways into the 21st. So thank you so much for joining us. I understand that we'll learn more about you in the pages of the Jewish Exponent sometime soon. Uh, and grateful, grateful for you to be here. And with that brief excursion, I'm very happy to call on my dear friend, Melissa Clapper. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. And welcome especially to Rebecca Gratz, whom I look forward to meeting um, as soon as um, our program concludes. Um, I just have to beg everyone's forgiveness. I have, I'm recovering from laryngitis. And so if I start to sound a little gravelly, just I'll keep on going, don't worry about it. Um, I'll try not to hack into the microphone. Um, so I'm here for two reasons. Um, one is that I am, I was a longtime colleague of Dr. Diane Ashton, who was Professor Emeritus of World Religions and Philosophy at Rowan University, where I've been teaching since 2001. And when I got there, she was already there and it was just wonderful to have a Jewish studies colleague already in place. Neither of us were hired to teach anything Jewish. She didn't do that at Rowan. I don't do that at Rowan either. I teach American and women's history, and I'm director of women's and gender studies. But it was just so great to have somebody there who could show me the ropes and with whom I shared so many interests. And actually, um, one of our a senior colleagues, a mentor to me, and also um, Zev Ellip's mentor, Jonathan Sarna, just thought he thought it was the funniest thing he had ever heard that two, the two, basically the two people who wrote about 19th century American Jewish women would end up at the same institution and not teach Jewish history. He found that very entertaining. So I'm here in her honor. Um, she wrote the book literally on Rebecca Gratz. She, it's not that Rebecca Gratz was unknown, as I'll discuss in a minute. People knew her name, obviously, and not only in Philadelphia. She was very known. And in fact, I first learned about Rebecca Gratz when I was in fourth grade. I had a teacher who during Women's History Week, as it was then, this is way back when, <laughs> um, instead of only putting up, I was in a Jewish day school, and instead of only putting up pictures about famous American women like Harriet Tubman and Rosa Parks and Eleanor Roosevelt, those types of people, who, you know, it's okay to have their picture on the wall. She said, well, this is a Jewish day school. We should have some Jewish women up on the wall. And the very first person whose picture she put up was Rebecca Gratz. 
And I remember as a fourth grader being very struck by this. Here's this Jewish woman up on the wall with Eleanor Roosevelt, which who's somebody that as a fourth grader, I was really in love with. And so in a way, I'm not gonna say that's the only thing that set me on my path toward a career in academia studying Jewish women, but it didn't hurt. And so I've known about Rebecca Gratz most of my life, and I'm delighted to be here to speak a little bit about her. No one could possibly do justice to the 19th century Rebecca Gratz and the amount of time that we have. But I'm gonna speak a little bit about some of the more public aspects of her career. And then we'll be hearing from Nina about the digitization project and a little bit more about her private life as it shows up in some of the letters. And we hope that we are whetting your appetite to learn more about her and about American Jewish women's history in general. So Rebecca Gratz was born in 1781 and died in 1869. Very long lived woman um, for that time period. And you'll note that those dates, 1781 to 1869, meant that she was born just as the American Revolution was sort of winding down and she died just after the Civil War. So she's actually of that generation that lived through some really important events in American history more generally. And her life was shaped by many different things. It was shaped by this passage of time in American history, a little bit from war to war, but certainly moments of real transformation in the United States. So American history shaped Rebecca Gratz. She was also Jewish, obviously, and, and that, meant, that mattered too, that her life was shaped by her Jewishness, what that meant to her, what it meant to the Philadelphia Jewish community that she was part of, which was, as we've just heard from Zev, one of the, probably the most important Jewish communities, is certainly through the end of the 19th century. And so that mattered too, her Jewishness mattered. And the fact that she was a, a woman, excuse me, the fact that she was a woman mattered. The fact that she was a woman in a time when women had limited opportunities, excuse me. But there were still people who made the most of their lives despite the, oppor the opportunities that were limited to them because they were women. Now in today's parlance, we would call this, you know, that we would talk about this as Rebecca Gratz's so-called intersectional identity, right? You can't take any pieces of her identity away. It mattered all the time that she was an American Jewish woman. Her life would not have been the same if she hadn't been a woman, if she hadn't been Jewish, if she hadn't been American. So all of those things mattered tremendously to her life. And one of the things that Rebecca Gratz did, she became basically the matriarch of a very large family, a family that did not stay only in Philadelphia, that, sp that spread out lots of places. She had brothers in business in Lancaster, and then there were relatives in Baltimore, and then there were relatives who moved to Kentucky. And there were people from the family and the extended family, a network of people in communities and Jewish communities, and also in places without very large Jewish communities all over the country. But Rebecca herself lived most of her life in Philadelphia. And that matters because there was a community here. There was the old, the old when I say old, I mean historic congregation of Mikveh Israel, right? The Sephardic congregation that her family belonged to. And there were also, you know, it, as was the case with many early American Jewish communities, there were other sorts of institutions and organizations within those communities. And Rebecca learned from her parents and then her siblings and then the entire family got involved with a variety of these institutions. But Rebecca was not involved only in Jewish institutions. And in fact, her first forays into sort of what was called benevolent work at the time, the idea that those who had should help those who had not. People who had some level of privilege, whether it was economic or educational, um, something like that, should go out into the world and try to help people who didn't have that. Sometimes that help was extremely heavy handed. I'm not going to um, go too dark, far down that route today. But the, the, the heart of it was that coming from a place of we want to help people. And women were seen as particularly suited to this kind of charitable work because it was their job to take care of the homes. And in fact, what many women did was to run with that, to say, okay, you're telling us that it is our job to take care of things outside the home because we're so good at taking care of things inside the home. See you later. <laughs> and this became a way in which women expanded their sphere of public activity by taking their domestic work and taking it outside of their own individual homes. That actually became a pattern in American and Western women's history in general. You're gonna tell us that we are responsible for keeping our homes clean, great. We'll take over to the sanitation and the sewage system in the city, no problem. You're gonna tell us that it's our job to educate the children, fantastic, we'll be all the teachers. You're gonna tell us that it's our job to take care of the sick, excellent, we'll build a new profession around nursing. So that women often took what was a constraint on their lives and made it something bigger. 
And Rebecca Gratz was part of the generation of women doing that in the early 19th century. They had the added advantage that there was this idea that because women were the mothers of the next virtuous citizens of tomorrow, meaning mostly men, they, and white men at that, um, it was there then women needed to be more educated than they had been because how else could they raise virtuous educated citizens? And so women's education expanded. And that was something that also was a benefit to Rebecca Gratz and then actually to um, her nieces and to her nephews and to in general, the next generation in the early 19th century. And so Rebecca became involved pretty early on in many of the women's benevolent organizations in Philadelphia. For instance, in 1801, there was the, just, I want to make sure I have to get the dates right. So I don't usually use notes, but in this case, I wanted dates. In 1801, the Female Association for the Relief of Women and Children in Reduced Circumstances. That's a mouthful. But the idea was that women were best placed to help women and children in reduced circumstances who had maybe had lost a husband or their male provider and needed to earn a living. Um, if there was sickness in the family, whatever the situation was, it was women who were best placed to help them, particularly with material goods like food and clothing. Women could make the clothing and sewing circles, for instance, and you know, women of a higher class status who could afford to give away the material and who had the time away from their own domestic responsibilities, often with household help, in order to help other people. So Rebecca Gratz was among the founders of that group in 1801 right at the beginning of the 19th century. In 1815, following the War of 1812, when the, uh, there was what, what many commentators the kind, at the time called there was an orphan problem. We don't often think at all about the War of 1812. Who thinks about it? Who cares about the War of 1812? It wasn't that big a deal, even at the time. But there were people who fought and died in the War of 1812 and in multiple cities around the new United States, including in Philadelphia, there was a concern about orphans that were left from this and really still left over from the American Revolution to a certain degree. And so Rebecca Gratz was involved in 1815 in establishing the Philadelphia Orphan Asylum. This is important because at, before that, children who were left orphaned, which in the 19th century might mean only losing one parent. It did not necessarily mean losing both parents. But if they couldn't be kept at home by whichever parent was left, or if there were no parent at all, they were often apprenticed and indentured out, and they had very little control over their lives. So the idea of this new Philadelphia orphan asylum was to improve that situation. By our standards, they still had very little control over their lives, but by the standards of the time, they weren't forcibly indentured out to work for other people for some prescribed length of time, and usually a long time until they were about 21. So the Philadelphia Orphan Asylum was an improvement on that plan, even though institutional living was not always the most, the healthiest environment. And I mean that in the literal sense of healthy um, environment, but they meant to try to prevent children from being taken advantage of by unscrupulous people who took them into their households to get free labor, essentially, bound out by the state. In many of these organizations, Rebecca played a public role. She very often was either the executive secretary, which is basically the CEO, okay, the person who did it all, or she was the treasurer. And this matters. How is it that she was the treasurer so often? Well, in the 19th century until the 1850s and later in many states, married women had no legal personhood. They could not handle money. There was no such person as Mrs. John Smith. That person did not exist legally. Mrs. John Smith couldn't sue or be sued. She couldn't be involved in business transactions. She couldn't sign contracts. There was no such person legally as Mrs. John Smith. Therefore, if you have all these married women involved in benevolent societies, they couldn't be the treasurers because if they were, then the treasury of that organization would actually be under the control of their husbands. And so very often unmarried women served as treasurer and Rebecca Gratz was there and served as the treasurer for many of the organizations she was involved in. And this is an example of how something that was happening in women's history more generally had a real impact on Rebecca Gratz and her public career. It also meant that once she started doing that for one group, she was seen to be responsible and really good at it, and so other groups would ask her to do the same. Now, in 1819, Rebecca Gratz and a number of other, the other, uh, other members of Congregation Mikvah Israel and other um, established sort of middle and upper class mem uh, members of the Philadelphia Jewish community looked around and said, all right, you know, we have the Female Association for the Relief of Women and Children in Reduced Circumstances, but one of the things that often happens when we send so-called lady visitors to help people is that part of their help is making sure that the people that they're helping are good Christians and worthy of being helped. And Rats and a few others said, you know, 
we're, we end up proselytizing to Jewish families who don't want to be proselytized to in the most, in most part. So maybe we need something within our own community to help people within our community. And so in 1819, the Female Hebrew Benevolent Society was founded. It did very similar work, but it did it within the Jewish community. This did not mean that Gratz quit her job as executive secretary at the non-sectarian, well, it wasn't non-sectarian, at the non-Jewish group. She did both. And that was another pattern of her life. She didn't feel that she had to choose activity in the Jewish community and the non-Jewish community. She did both and was well, as renowned in both the larger Philadelphia community and actually the larger national scene of female benevolence during this period and within the Jewish community. And the missionizing was a problem not only for helping women and children, but also in schools. And this was a this is a bigger problem. We can't I don't have time to go into the uh, into the whole history of Jewish education in America. But the public schools that many families were sending their children to were not non sectarian in the way we understand them to be today. Throughout much of the early part, part of the 19th century, public schools were effectively Protestant and missionized. This led to all kinds of problems in Philadelphia. For instance, in the 1840s, there was a series of what were called the Bible Wars, where in neighborhoods like in Kensington, there were actually riots over which Bible would be used in the school, a Catholic or a Protestant Bible, and people were actually killed in these riots. This is serious stuff. Um, so public schools were not neutral at all during this period. And as the Jewish community was growing, there was increasing concern over what, was, what were Jewish children going to learn in these schools. Most Jewish families still opted to use the public school system as a mechanism of Americanization. They weren't interested in sort of taking themselves out of the citizenship education that was possible in these schools. Um, some Catholics did. This is where the system of parochial schools came from. But most, very few Jews in this period did that. But instead, Rebecca Grass decided, well, what we need is a system of Jewish education. And in 1838, she and some colleagues, also involved with Mikra Israel, founded the Hebrew Sunday School Society, which provided supplemental Jewish education to children, typically on Sundays, sometimes on, eventually on Saturdays. So that's where the name Sunday School, it's borrowed from the Protestant uh, model, um, or sometimes they were called Sabbath schools, depending on the community. This was also a big deal because who are the teachers in the Hebrew Sunday School? Women. And this is basically on a communal level, the first time in all of Jewish history, there were exceptions. The Cairo Geniza, for instance, talks about Jewish women teaching Jewish stuff, but it's a communal thing um, where Jewish women were the religious teachers. And so the Hebrew Sunday School Society had an impact on children and it, this model of Philadelphia was taken up in other communities. Um, I'm working now on a woman who was in Richmond in the 1840s who started a Hebrew Sabbath school there that was explicitly modeled on what Rebecca Gratz had done here. But they also meant that women had to learn more so that as teachers, women had the, you know, had the responsibility to learn a little bit more about Judaism as well. So there was a major impact on the American Jewish community overall because of what Rebecca Gratz did in helping to start this. It's the first public role for women and Jewish education in a major way. That's not just an individual case by case thing. And this spread throughout, this spread throughout the United States. Another thing that Rebecca Gratz noticed, especially once she was more in touch with more children, she did some of the teaching herself in these Sunday schools, was that there, there were kids, there were kids who were in the Philadelphia orphanage, the regular Philadelphia orphanage, who would come to Mikvah Israel and to the other places where the Hebrew School Society was setting up classes. And she found that those children were under missionizing assault, not just in their schools, but also in the orphanage. And so just like had been the case before, she and a group of others decided, you know what, we need a Jewish orphanage. So in 1855, she helped establish the Jewish foster home, which lasted for decades, which is the same kind of thing. And again, it's not that she stopped her involvement in the secular organizations. She expanded her involvement to include both Jewish and non-Jewish, so to speak, organizations. And, you know, as I've mentioned that she was involved, excuse me, with 18 different organizations. I'm not going to go through them all here. It's quite a list. <laughs> it's an impressive list. But just in giving you this little taste of what she was doing, you can see how somebody like Rebecca Gratz became extremely important, not only to herself, but to generations of American Jewish women after her, as someone who had successfully managed to balance 
all the different elements of her identity. She's American, she's Jewish, she's a woman. She acts on all of those things at the same time, all the time. And that made her a huge role model, not just to her own generation, but for generations thereafter. And not only to people who are related to her, but to people all over the United States who look to her. So in my book about American Jewish women's activism in the suffrage, birth control, and peace movements much later in the late 1800s, early 1900s, I find all the time that American Jewish women, multiple generations later, who certainly would never have met Rebecca Gratz, still invoke her as their model of somebody who doesn't just stay home and somebody who takes what's good about the Jewish home and takes it out there into the world, somebody who uses um, her role as a woman to justify what it is that she's doing out there in the world. And so you have references to Rebecca Gratz by all the, ne the next many generations of American Jewish women who become communal leaders and who give Jewish women the reputation among women's organizations all over the United States as being the most enthusiastic and efficient <laughs> group of women who are involved in this kind of thing. So for instance, I've got peace activists from Europe coming to the United States after World War I and everywhere they go, they say in their own correspondence, everywhere we go, Jewish women come to hear us. The Jewish women's groups bring us in to speak. They're the best ones to talk to. <laughs> if you wanna get stuff done, talk to the Jewish women. And that's a legacy that Rebecca Gratz left from her public life. And now I'll go ahead and turn it over to Nina, who will talk a little bit about her private life. And um, after the program is over, I'll be in the back with some of my books for sale, if anyone's interested, and I'll be happy to discuss this further. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Melissa. Nina Varnka is here. Nina is <clears throat> has a long established relationship with Gratz College. She is a uh, master uh, with languages, is a teacher both at Gratz and Evo and, and elsewhere uh, for here. Uh, Nina has taken on this incredibly sacred project as now the lead editor of 800 Rebecca Gratz letters. We collected them from the, there was a very neat and discreet diaspora. And so we worked with Rosenbach, with the American Philosophical Society, with the University of North Carolina, with the American Jewish Historical Society, with Transylvania University. And I think there's a letter from the University of Kentucky. I think I covered them all because the AJA is all duplicates. Um, and we brought them together with the power of the internet. And while those letters remain in those host institutions, to leverage our combined forces to produce something absolutely incredible uh, has, been, has been more than I could have possibly imagined uh, during my early conversations with Diane. And uh, Nina, this is an opportunity to thank you. Uh, and you worked with Julie first, and now you have, you're bringing your team forward um, to make sure, because Rebecca Gratz had great penmanship, but Google cannot search her handwriting. So they do need to be, the, uh, the power of being able to identify orphans, Passover, uh, Civil War, all the different areas in which Rebecca Gratz made a deep impact. Um, we need it to be transcribed. And so Nina's taken on that project. There is a science to it that she, us, we lay people uh, will learn a little bit from her, um, but it's, it's a labor of science. It's a labor of art. And Nina, I know it's a labor of love. So very glad to introduce you to all of us and uh, for you to show us around. Thank you very much, Zef, for your kind words. Uh, I'm excited to be here um, or to be with you even if only virtually, I am currently in Missoula, Montana, a beautiful state to be in, but I, I wish I could be in the room with you. I could see the uh, Rebecca Gratz hats and, um, and talk to you in person, but this is the best we can do. Um, so I'm very excited. I have uh, to be here and tell you about um, the project. I've been reading Rebecca Gratz's letter now that is for uh, half a year and transcribing them. And every day is a new day of discovery. Um, every day there's something else that I didn't know about her or about her family and, 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 and the life that she and her contemporaries were living and the concerns they had. So to me, this is a, 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 a constant quest for new, exciting information. And I do want to acknowledge that my co-editor, Rachel Davis, is 
also online. She's listening in. Um, unfortunately, she couldn't uh, join you in person either. Um, so we are, uh, when I speak of we, I mean uh, Julie Fisher, who was working with me earlier, and now uh, Rachel, uh, who is working with me now in creating a digital archive of Rebecca Gratz's letters. So I want to start out by briefly sh uh, sharing with you um, the website. I'm not going to go into much detail, but I do want to give you a sense of what you can find there. Um, and this is the um, this is the the landing page. I will look here. I will go to collection items. And if we do that, we essentially have a long list that I could cannot go through. Here it is, 786 items um, that could all be access to this website. The idea is that eventually they will all be transcribed and they will all be fully searchable. But many are already searchable. Um, and so you can put in any kind of keyword and you would see what kind of letters might um, come up. So we could do um, yellow fever, a topic that if I have time, we'll talk about a little later. Uh, and you can see that six of the transcribed letters mention yellow fever, right? So you can put all sorts of information in. You can sort by date, by origin, that is from where it was written or to where it was written, right? She writes to her youngest brother, Ben, in Lexington, uh, Kentucky, usually. Um, so you can sort by a variety of different ways. Um, provenance, where the letters, the originals reside. Um, here is, um, this is about, let me get rid of the yellow fever and go back to all our 786 items. So we could look at who are the authors that have that have uh, written either to her or obviously um, she has written to them. So we have quite a few um, names of the family as well as a variety of friends. And, uh, and you can see the list is long. The list is very long. Um, we can also look at the recipients. Who has Rebecca written to? Um, and again, a lot of family and even more friends. And as Melissa said, she was the matriarch of a very large family. They were 12 siblings. And she lived with, I think, two or three of her brothers in Philadelphia. She had a very lively co correspondence with her beloved brother, Ben, uh, who was in Lexington, Kentucky. And um, she kept people abreast of what's going on. She would tell who is doing what, and especially for those who are far away, she would share news about friends and family. Um, origin, if we were to look, these are the places that letters came from. Most, of course, from Philadelphia, um, but a few others from other places as, as well. And of course, destination. Where were these letters written to? Again, most of those were written by Rebecca, but there was correspondence. These, this archive has letters to Rebecca as well. And in some cases, very lively correspondence between friends. Um, and you can sort of get a sense of the conversation that's going on, not just the one-way street, um, that in most cases we have. I do want to show you very briefly um, a couple of letters to show you where in the process we are. This is a work in progress, and it will continue to be a work in progress for a quite a long time because, after all, 786 letters, 
do take a lot of time. So I wanted to show you, um, just look at my notes here, this letter. And this is what the ideal should look like when everything is said and done. You would have at the top the date and who is writing to whom. And then you have a very brief summary of the letter. On the left, you have the original and you can scroll through it. And on the right, you have our transcription. And I will not go into details about how we deal with things that we may not understand or may not know. Um, for that, there is a uh, cheat sheet <laughs> to look at on the website, uh, but this will make things easier to read because even though her handwriting is quite clear, even after half a year of reading letters every day, we stumble. We don't know, especially names become really difficult to decipher sometimes. Um, and she uses sometimes a different vocabulary or a different spelling. And so it becomes a bit of a, um, you know, search for what it could be. In what is so important here is once you have this transcript, you can, any of these words could be searched, right? So if you were to look, not that it matters or it makes sense, if you were to look for um, a word like, incendiary, you would find every single letter that mentions this word. But you can look through names and through um, put in theater and um, get information that way. We do have a whole list that is the me so-called metadata with all the names that are mentioned in the letter. And it is important that they are here as well because very often, she mentions only a first name or a last name, uh, or she misspells on occasion a name, especially when it is um, when it is foreign. And as far as I remember, this one was misspelled in the original. Um, so we can't rely on the transcript alone to find necessarily all the mentions of, let's say, um, David Seshas, who was. Um, the founder of the Deaf and Dumb Society in Philadelphia. Uh, so we need a, a list of authoritative, an authoritative list of names and ideally with dates, because another thing is that a lot of names are very similar. In a family, um, the same names run through generations. There is a Miriam and another Miriam and a third and a fourth and a fifth. And so learning to read by context and understand who, oh, which Miriam is this one? And this must be that Hyman and so on and so forth becomes part of the process. So it's not just sitting and transcribing. It is also really trying to under, learn to understand the context in which she lives and works. And the same is true for uh, geographic terms and then topics. And you can see in this particular letter, we have um, from crime to dueling, to fashion and clothing, to education, to Passover, um, a wide range of, of topics. Now, not all letters um, at this very moment will look like this. Um, you will find letters that are, let me find, go down here. This one, it has the summary, it has the original, and it also has a transcript. But as if you scroll down, you can see this transcript is still a draft which means that we as an editing team have not proofread it together as um, which is the quality control, right? Because two people 
have better eyes than just one and we can help each other figure out oh which one is this person and what could that mean so this in this case drafts mean it's the best the first best read but it's not complete and you can also see here that the metadata are not complete there are some names but there's no topics and and so on so this is the second best way of accessing them and then we have those that are i think this one where everything seems to be undated and unknown which means eventually there will be dated and eventually there will be known origin and so on this is a letter that we have not started to transcribe yet and here it is but we have no metadata so whatever is in this letter cannot be at this point searched for so if there was something of interest here it cannot come up yet once it's transcribed then you can search for it so this is the state we have at this point um about 200 letters or more than 200 letters in various stages on this site um, but we have 500 more to go so with that i hope this um, tempts you to to explore a little bit um, and and read for yourselves but i do want to um, i'm trying to pull up my powerpoint here Meaning I need to share again. There we go. Um, what is so special about this collection is that we have almost her entire lifetime in her handwriting. Right? The first letter that is part of this collection is from 1800 when she was 19 years old, and the last was the last in this collection was from 1866 a few years before she passed away at age 85. you can see that her handwriting in some ways is very similar but it also you know as she ages she writes larger and not quite as carefully as she did of course as a as a younger woman so as we transcribe we are also learning how her handwriting changes which is important as we learn to decipher words so for instance here we have the word happiness and we can see how these p's are really tall and we also see that convention the 19th century convention of the long s and the short s as which today we would write of course with two regular s's um the topics that you find in the letter you can see here that is not all the all the topics but it gives you a sense of all the things that come up over and over again and i think what becomes really clear here is what is important in these letters health child rearing children um, childhood mortality, mental health. A lot is going on around her interest and her, well, she describes, of course, the health situation of her family uh, and friends. Um, but she's also really interested in, in child rearing, of course. It shows in her public work, but it also comes out in her letters. Um, but we can also find mentions of literature literary figures of course she comments on the on politics the wars or in other places she talks about literature she is um, very close friends with some people who are working in uh, or contributing to um, literary magazine uh, literary journals of the time Salma Gundi being one of them so uh, we can find all sorts of topics and we never know when we open a letter what we'll find um so one i want to read a very long um more than an excerpt um although it is shortened 
um, to give a letter from 1811, which I think gives you a sense of her style, of her, the, the, the variety of topics that she um, talks about. And I think it's a really, it's, it's, I mean, I could have chosen so many other letters, but this one I felt like had a really wide range of different topics and also how she relates to people. And this is to her very, very close friend, Maria Fenno Hoffman, who lived in uh, Philadelphia when they grew up and then moved to New York. And she starts out with, and I will try to follow along here with my cursor, so maybe you can read along. Once more, my dear Maria, I have the pleasure of thanking uh, you for a letter which I began to despair of ever, um, sorry, of ever having it in my power to do again, and had been pouting and complaining like a humored child who had long been long indulged with a favorite amusement, which was all at once withheld without any reason being assigned for the deprivation. So she makes a little bit of fun of herself, something that she does from time to time. Uh, she can be witty, one needs to learn to see the wit, but um, she, um, she has quite a sense of humor, which is lovely to see. And I will go on reading. Um, so after basically telling her friend Maria, well, you haven't written for a long time and I'm, I never expected you to, to hear from you again. She talks about um, uh, Maria's stepdaughter, Anne, who is in Philadelphia and says, Anne and I are in the habit of comparing notes on this subject of receiving letters. Uh, she says, you are very cautious of exciting any jealousy between us, that you seldom give her a longer one than you send to me, and are more just and equitable in all your dealings, but not quite so generous in epistolary matters as one could wish. However, I'm less disposed to murmur at the past than to be thankful for the present favor and look forward to the future with a hope of more abundant harvest. Our friend Mrs. Meredith will be in New York tomorrow, and I hope you will see her. She has been about 10 days at the Vale, which is their country residence, and is a good deal affected at the thoughts of the families leaving it. I received a charming letter from her this morning, there is nothing more calculated to affect a mind of sensibility than revisiting a spot once the seat of hospitality and joy and to find it spoiled of the venerable and respected host and everywhere observing sorrow and desolation and mourning instead of the voice of mirth and domestic enjoyment. So she talks here about Mrs. Meredith having lost her father and the family selling the, the estate. And um, those kinds of reflections on death uh, appear very, very regularly. Um, and she always does it with, with great empathy. Then she moves to another topic, the theater. There it ex ex describes a early 19th century fan culture. And at the center of this was the uh, actor, um, the actor uh, Cooper. It is well, so Maria was in the middle of moving, so she didn't have time to go to the theater. So she says, it is well, Cook and Cooper are not performing in New York at this important moment, or I apprehend your sober citizens would be completely beat off the ground. Nothing can exceed the struggling for boxes, the crowding at the doors of the theater, the pressing for seats, and the delights of the audience. For four successive nights, we have been quite deserted. Everybody gone to the play. 
and I never heard such praise bestowed on mortal powers before. She goes on to mention Thomas Sully, the portrait painter. Sully has made a fine picture of him and we are to have a full length one placed in the Academy of Arts. I wonder if it's still there. Thus, you see public honors are decreed to this great actor. A young man, and here she talks about Sully, who is at the beginning of his career, um, a young man of extraordinary talents who has never been instructed in the art of painting has made several likenesses of Cook in the different uh, characters in which he has appeared. He has gained great celebrity, celebrity from them and I hear is patronized by the Society of Artists who mean to send him to England to be instructed by West, meaning Benjamin West, the painter. So here she comments on what is happening in, um, in Philadelphia. But she also, and it's very interesting, she, um, she does, although she does go to affairs, to theater uh, on occasion, she is much more home than a lot of the, uh, the family members. Um, so she observes more than she actually participates in the um, so social events. Um, she moves on to talk about several other people and then talks about um, Maria's brother, George. I'm glad to hear George has a prospect of gratifying his wishes in a voyage. My brother Jacob is anxious to follow his example and I fear we shall have to part with him too. Ben has completed his college studies and unless he fixes himself down in a profession, will perhaps feel the same disposition to wander. And so she often writes to her brothers who are traveling, whether in the States or in Europe, um, and uh, sort of watches and learns about different countries and places through their uh, experiences rather than actually going herself, which she often really regrets. And she ends, the girls, which means the sisters and um, nieces, send you their affectionate love. Present me affectionately to your husband and Eliza and Mary, which are who are uh, siblings of um, Maria. And believe me, my dearest friend, ever most truly, your Rebecca Grass. Um, so I wish I could show you or read you more. I know we are running out of time. I had several other examples um, prepared. So I will just tell you uh, a wonderful, some wonderful letters to children and how she talks to them about, and these are the sons of her brother Ben in Lexington. And um, she talks about missing them and imagining how what they are doing and so on. In another letter, she writes to Maria's children about Little Red Riding Hood. She also talks very often about epidemics. And in this case, she, she informs her sister-in-law, Maria Gistgratz, that the yellow fever epidemic has uh, reached Philadelphia. And, um, and so, and describes in this case, uh, how the city deals with a public um, epidemic um, was reminding me certainly of our discussions around what to do with COVID. So I need to end here, but um, I hope you got a little bit of a taste of what's out there in the, in the archives and that you will peruse it and maybe even potentially try your luck at transcribing some letters as well. So thank you very much. And I'll turn it back to Laurie. Um, hello, everybody, again. Um, thank you so much um, to Nina Vanka and to Melissa Clapper 
Thank you very much. And I'd like to actually open it up for any questions now. I'll read, if you have anything, you can stand up. So um, we'll, we have the microphones on in the ceiling. So you can ask your question or I can ask it here from the podium. Anything? Yes. So there are no artificial intelligence or computers that could transcribe without doing it by human eyes? Uh, the question is, um, are there no artificial intelligence, any computers that could do this transcription instead of us uh, lowly humans? <laughs> well, not yet. Not not as well as we need to uh, to really deal with this kind of complexity. It is still very much human work, and it also is, as Zev said, it's it's a science, but it's also an art. And AI cannot quite perform the art piece. So humans are still necessary. Thank God. <laughs> uh, yes, there's another question. Yep. Um, so I think this is from Melissa. The, so I was really curious that you mentioned that she was single for a very long time, and I don't know her history. Did she ever get married? No. no. Okay. If she didn't, it was interesting that the letters talked about child rearing. And what, if anything, do the letters or does the history show about how she was received as a single woman during that era? Um, so I'll start off. So Rebecca Gratz did not marry. Um, I was just, just having a discussion with, a little bit about this with Zev right before. Um, she she did not marry, but she did actually raise children. Um, her, her sister died fairly young, and Rebecca essentially raised, I think it was six children of, um, of her sister. Plus, she constantly had nieces and nephews from all over the place in and out of her house and the house of her siblings around her. So she did raise children, even though she was not married herself. You know, in the 19th century, some women, including some of the women whose names we know well, another example um, would be Susan B. Anthony, who had never married. There were a lot of choices that women had to make if they had the ability to make those choices. Because of the legal environment, because of the lack of access to education and to different kinds of jobs, there were some women who chose not to get married. Anthony is an example of that. She explicitly like made a choice. She was actually proposed to twice when she was a young woman. She felt that she had a mission and a calling in the world around first around abolition, then temperance, then women's rights. And she couldn't do it if she got married. And actually for her, the best example of that became her colleague in the women's rights movement, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was married, had seven children. And through all the years that she was raising children, felt, Stanton felt, trapped in her home because she had to take care of her kids and she couldn't go on the road to um, be an advocate for women's rights the way that Susan B. Anthony did. They had an effective partnership. We don't really know if that's a choice that Rebecca Gratz made. Right? We just don't know that, right? Even with all the letters we have from her, all the information about her family, we don't always know from the past why people did things or didn't do things. There were a number of prominent American Jewish figures, women and men, who did not marry. In the antebellum period, there was actually a limited number of Jewish people for other Jewish people to marry. There were also plenty of Jewish people who did not marry Jewish people, including several of Gratz's siblings. Um, and so it's not like that necessarily stopped people from marrying. Some of them just married non-Jewish people, but it is it is the case. Uh, I'm working on this other large antebellum Jewish family now, the Mordecais, who lived throughout the South. And um, some of them also chose or were not to get married, or in one case, really would have liked to, but couldn't find anybody. She couldn't find a nice Jewish boy, basically. <laughs> um, there weren't that many Jews in the United States before the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So even people who lived in larger communities, like the one in Philadelphia, had a certain level of not, they didn't have as many choices as they might have liked. We can't, so I can't speak to Gratz herself. Was it a choice that she made? Was it something that just sort of happened to her? Was, you know, th there are rumors in her history that she had a sort of unrequited love for a non-Jewish man. Oh. When I say unrequited, I actually don't mean that they didn't care for each other. I meant that they could, didn't get married because she, it was very important to her to marry somebody Jewish. So she didn't act on it. Um, Diane Ashton used to say that you, you know, who, who was the expert, the, the Gratz's biographer, that she just really didn't know. You know, yes, this person certainly existed in her life, but was it the case that they had this, you know, kept apart by faith sort of relationship? It's it's very hard to say that for the past, even when you have somebody who's as well documented as Gratz, but she's not the only one. And it is worth noting, I mean, and this is this is an issue in women's history, particularly in the Western world. A lot of the women, the famous women, the one whose pictures go up on the wall, mm -hmm. um, you know, in fourth grade classrooms, 
not an inconsiderable number of them never married. And there's questions about whether they would have been able to do what they did if they had because of the situation around them, not because of any personal failing on their part, but because the system was rigged and it was against women and it was particularly rigged against married women who had to give up a lot. You have the same problem in the next, in a later generation in the 1890s or 1880s, 1890s, the first, when you have the first large numbers of women going to college, including Jewish women. There too, I mean, women who went to college did marry in lower numbers. Like that is just a demographic fact. Is it a choice? Is it because they you know, chose a career? Is it because they knew it was an either or situation and they couldn't have both and they made a decision? We just, you know, we don't always know. They don't write about it explicitly. What you very rarely find, even in fantastic letters like this, and with this, I'll turn it over to Nina, you very rarely find someone saying, I am choosing not to get married because of these six reasons. There's no such thing as a primary source or a document that does that. Um, and so it's, you have to read between lines, you have to make inferences, you have to make guests, guesses, and the histor it's the historian's job to do that, uh, you know, with knowledge and understanding of the context, but also with humility. <laughs> There's only so much you can know about the person who's sitting next to you right now, or the person you share your life with, let alone people from way back who only left us a small piece of their voice to recover. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, mean, I know we're already going over time. Are we okay to take a couple more questions? Yeah. Okay, I think I saw your hand first. Uh, is there any information that she expressed any interest in the abolitionist movement? Okay, the question is, was there um, any evidence that Rebecca Gratz had an involvement in the abolitionist movement? Well, I can, uh, I'm sure Melissa knows more than I do. Um, I can certainly say that um, she, I, I don't know specifically about uh, her activities. I don't think she was active, um, but she, her correspondence, especially during the um, Civil War, sort of shows to some degree her own position and and the complex family situation where quite a few of her family lived in the South or close friends lived in the South. Um, her favorite niece lived in the South, her brother Ben did uh, in Kentucky. And, um, and Ben had a complex relationship with uh, slavery himself. So there are certainly questions that surround, but I haven't found yet, and I still have many letters to read, found yet any specific discussion of it. And Melissa probably knows much more about this. I will just say very briefly that the abolitionist movement was extremely unfriendly to Jews and actively anti-Semitic in some cases. And so although there were plenty of Jews who did not believe in slavery and who wished to see it abolished um, or did not personally believe in slavery, there were relatively few American Jews actively involved in the movement per se. And most of the ones who were, were immigrants who had come to the United States following the revolutions in um, Western and Central Europe in 1848. They were 48ers of various kinds and they came as political radicals. And so they cared less about the fact that the abolitionist <laughs> movement was not very hospitable. Um, so that, that's a very short answer to a complicated question about a, a bigger question, which I don't think we should really spend too much more time on here about the relationship between Jews and abolition and slavery. Um, it's a, these are complicated kinds of questions with messier answers than some people might want to hear. <laughs> One last question. I saw you. Yes. <laughs> Besides the eighteen organizations that the organization, was she involved in any way in the family business? Or so was that in the letter or something? Uh, the question is, was Rebecca Grass involved in the family business? If we can nail down exactly what that business was. <laughs> So there's not, the, uh, she wasn't actively involved in the business very often, but the family was the business in the sense that the network of family members in various places, Kentucky and Lancaster and Baltimore and Philadelphia and where, you know, all the other places they lived, family and business were not necessarily separate from each other in terms of trade networks and passing along information and um, just the way economic decisions were made. So she herself was not 
explicitly involved in the business, except that as the matriarch of the family and the one through whom a lot of information passed, she still was at the center of the family enterprise, let's call it. What was the business? They were, they were merchants. They were merchants involved in, in, all, kinds, in all kinds of trade. Um, you know, they, it, it, dry goods. I mean, just all, all they traded lots of stuff. <laughs> and the ones who lived in larger cities were often sometimes involved in sort of the local stock and bond markets as well. That's, again, a short answer to a long question. <laughs> and, and in her letters, just to add to that, um, she usually doesn't mention any uh, business related topics. Um, even when she writes to her brother, Ben, she keeps it more to about the family. Um, and sometimes the brothers will add a brief part of the letter and talk more specifically about some business matters. But she herself, at least in the letters that I've read so far, um, does not really engage actively in the business. But she is an important link. And that's, you know, as, as the matriarch, absolutely. Okay, everybody, let's thank our wonderful presenters, Nina and Melissa. Luther. My name is Naomi Hausman. I direct um, institutional advancement here at Gratz. I work with this wonderful team. So thank, thanks again to all of you for this beautiful event. And thank you all for being here. Thank you to all of those of you who wore beautiful hats. I feel silly to not have brought my own hat. So we need to have another tea party. Um, so thanks all of you. I do want to thank um, Rebecca Gratz for coming all the way from Kentucky. <laughs> and I want to, um, if Phyllis Cohen and Carmi Levine are in the room, I wanted to give them a special shout out. Hi. Um, they are both representatives from the, of the Female Hebrew Benevolent Society. So we... <laughs> Thank you for being here. And uh, it's good to know that it's not just history, but it is present day reality. So beautiful. Um, I did want to share one last thing. Uh, as the as the person who leads advancement here, I do want to let you know that we are still, uh, we are currently raising funding for this wonderful project of, of digitizing the letters. Uh, so please talk to me if you're interested in, in supporting that. And also, if you have been inspired by Nina and Melissa to try your hand at the art and science of transcription, uh, we will on July, Sunday, July 9th, we will have a free training and transcription. Um, I believe you can participate online in person, I'm not sure, but definitely online. Um, it will be a part of our summer institute for our graduate students. We're opening it up to the community. Learning to transcribe is a really cool thing. We're looking for volunteers. Um, so if you're interested, come talk to me, come talk to Lori, anybody on our staff, and we will also send an email probably tomorrow to thank you all for being here and also to remind you if you're interested in this volunteer activity to raise your hand and let us know. So thank you everybody. Have a wonderful day.